I'm here to introduce Dr. Daniel Moak, who is a member of both themes and faculty with the Department of African American Studies. Uh, Dr. Moak has what is going to be sharing with us part of a research agenda that more broadly focuses on the historical development of the tight connection between schools and prisons. That's the title, Class Absence and Case Study on the Limitations of the School to Prison Narrative. And how this has resulted, this trajectory, in problematic policy outcomes for young people and poor children of color in particular. Uh, I should also add that in terms of uh, the work that he's currently doing, he'll have a forthcoming contribution in the African American political thought and edited history. And it's a chapter contribution that traces the work of Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall. Um, Justice Marshall developed a very specific understanding of the reasons for black subordination in the United States as well as political strategies most likely to be effective. He argues, that is Dr. Moe, not Justice Marshall, um, effectively consolidated the NAACP and broader civil rights movement around his political vision. We're really pleased for him to, to be here to share both his research and his teaching because if any of you have had him um, as an instructor, you know he very much brings the research into the classroom and involves his students. Um, he's currently working on a book project that traces the historical development of pu punitive education policies and the rise of high stakes testing regimes and tracing the consequences for citizens, particularly their negative consequences for the poor people of color. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Daniel Bond. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. I am an assistant professor in the African American Studies Department. And today, I'm going to be talking about some of my recent in-process uh, uh, research is really looking at uh, the school to prison pipeline. And it's what I'm talking about today is focusing specifically on a particular case study in Bakersfield, California, uh, Kern County, California. Uh, and this is work that I did with a colleague, Dr. Sarah Kate at uh, University of Southern Mississippi. And it was work that was supported by uh, a grant from the California Endowment. Uh, as Dr. Muhammad noted it's part of a broader uh, research agenda that's looking at the historical development of our tendency to associate schools and prisons. Uh, so by a show of hands, how many people have heard of the school to prison pipeline? Has anybody not heard of it? So a couple of people. All right, uh, good. I want to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page uh, when we're talking, when we sort of are discussing this idea of what the school to prison pipeline is. Uh, really, it is a metaphor or a framework uh, that posits a sort of direct connection between school disciplinary policies and ultimately youth incarceration and more broadly, mass incarceration. Uh, this is a quote from Senator Richard Durbin, who's the number two Democrat uh, in the United States Senate. And in 2013, he held a hearing specifically about the problem of the school to prison pipeline. Uh, so this is a quote from his introductory remarks. He says, for many young people, our schools are increasingly a gateway to a criminal justice system. This phenomenon is a consequence of a culture of zero tolerance that is widespread in our schools and depriving many children of their fundamental right to education. So uh, as just mentioned, this idea of a school to prison pipeline is a framework that posits a direct connection between what happens in school and uh, eventually uh, youth incarceration and mass incarceration more generally. Uh, there's a particular focus on school disciplinary policies within this literature. Uh, Many people point to the rise of get tough policies in the mid 90s and the late 90s in response to things like uh, school shootings and crime within school as responsible for drawing a tight connection between the education system and the criminal justice system. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of uh, research that focuses on the role of race in the construction of this school to prison pipeline. Uh, and many people position it as the explanation for why so many youth of color end up in prison. Uh, as indicated by the number of the hands that went up when I asked the question, there is 
sort of a widespread understanding or acceptance of this as a framework for talking about these two issues. Uh, since the mid-1990s, I checked uh, Google a little while ago and I found that there had been seven special journal issues, 50 symposia, 294 academic journals, 876 news stories, and 263 books about this topic, the school to prison pipeline. So it's very widespread in our uh, sort of collective understanding of these processes. However, my colleague and I, while we were doing our own research, we had some sort of questions about some of the assumption uh, and the explanations that are built into the School of Prison Pipeline that didn't really make a whole lot of sense to us, given our own research areas. I focused on the development of education uh, policies. Uh, her area of expertise was juvenile justice policy. Uh, so we really wanted to do an on-the-ground case study to see whether or not what we were reading in the literature sort of jived with what was going on on the ground uh, with people that actually had to experience these policies. So after doing some research of where we might look to test out some of these uh, things that we were hearing from the literature, we settled on uh, California and Kern County specifically to test this out. Uh, Kern County is this county right here, so you can see it's in. Uh, Southern California. It's in the uh, southern part of the Central Valley, which is an area of California that's dominated by agricultural uh, production and also oil. Uh, this is a couple of pictures from when we went out there. This is East Bakersfield High. The mascot is actually the drillers. Uh, this was a parking lot next to the uh, hotel where we were staying in downtown uh, Bakersfield, where there's an oil derrick just in the middle of downtown. It was a bizarre sight to me, but very common uh, down there. This area in general, you probably uh, have encountered it in, in different ways. It's actually the setting for the Grapes of Wrath, is this part of California. Also the setting for the book uh, Oil by Upton Sinclair, which was turned into There Will Be Blood. Uh, and then also the site for Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta's work in organizing the United Farm Workers back in the 1960s. So. Uh, you probably have heard of it uh, tangentially, if not directly. Uh, and we decided to focus specifically on California because going back to the 1940s, it has often had the highest rate of youth incarceration of any state uh, in the country, oftentimes accounting for up to 30% of the entirety of incarcerated juveniles. So it made sense that this would be an area that we would look. Uh, and we wanted to do a little bit more of a granular analysis than just looking at the state. We wanted to see like, what these policies looked like on the ground, in part because a lot of the decisions about disciplinary policies are made at the local level. Uh, and we decided to limit our focus to a particular county, which ended up being Kern. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why we chose Kern County. Uh, in 2009-2010 school year, Kern County expelled more children than any school district in uh, California, including LA County. So LA County had 10 times the number of students, but Kern County actually had twice the number of expulsions. Uh, Kern County had an expulsion rate that was 36 times higher than the national average. Uh, and there was a lot of high profile coverage of the sort of expulsion and suspension crisis within Kern County that sort of uh, started getting attention about this time period. These are just sort of some of the headlines that started popping up. Another reason we decided to focus on Kern County was in 2014, a number of groups filed a civil rights lawsuit actually challenging uh, the school district's policies. Uh, and in the lawsuit, they said, quote, uh, the discipline policies of Kern High School District have resulted in a pattern that has been nationally studied and described as the school to prison pipeline. So they were talking about what was happening in Kern County as an example of the school to prison pipeline. So for these reasons, this is sort of the ideal site for looking at uh, uh, th this issue. And we went and did some field work back in March where we interviewed students, teachers, administrators, the school district, superintendent, and a couple of other people within the community. So after our field interviews and sort of broader research uh, and looking at the state, local, and federal data on school discipline and youth incarceration uh, and examination of the historical developments of these institutions, we sort of came to the conclusion that there's a quite a bit of evidence that contradicted some of the key themes that emerged from the school to prison uh, pipeline literature. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing on two broad challenges to our understanding of the school-to-prison pipeline in this talk. First 
is that school discipline policies are rarely responsible for the direct incarceration of youth in Kern County, in California, and indeed nationally. Uh, and more broadly, there's not really uh, much youth imprisonment that is directly tied to uh, uh, school disciplinary policies. Second, contrary to a lot of the literature that emerges that from the school to prison pipeline literature, uh, particularly from those that engage in critical race theory scholarship, uh, focusing on race does not really offer a full explanation of school disciplinary policies or really help us point us towards strategies that might help dismantle some of these policies. Uh, finally, uh, I'll argue that pipeline thinking uh, often obscures more than it illuminates and leads us into dead-end solutions. If we actually want to overturn some of these policies, we have to think about uh, this issue in a different way. So focusing on this first argument that school discipline policies are rarely responsible for incarceration of youth, uh, sort of three things that I want to point out. Uh, we want to focus on the, uh, despite the contention that the uh, school to prison pipeline literature suggests the direct funneling of students from schools into prison, uh, when we look at the numbers in California, we find very little evidence that this is occurring. Uh, we, in fact, find three things. That contact between students and the juvenile justice system uh, through the schools rarely leads to juvenile incarceration. So there rarely is that direct connection. Uh, we also find that school disciplinary referrals of youth to the juvenile justice system are a minuscule part of youth referrals in the overall uh, juvenile, juvenile justice system. The vast majority come from outside the schools. The so schools are not really contributing that much. Uh, and then finally, the account provided uh, by the school to prison pipeline framework is ahistorical. Uh, and in fact, the rise of juvenile incarceration predates the rise of punitive uh, policies within the school. So focusing on uh, that first point, uh, a lot of those working within the school to prison pipeline framework make claims like the two quotes that I put up here. Uh, this first quote is from a fairly famous study uh, that looks at the connection between uh, juvenile uh, incarceration and school discipline. Uh, it's from a, quote, a study in Texas in 2011. Uh, and it, here's a quote from the piece. A student who was suspended or expelled for a discretionary violation was nearly three times as likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system uh, the following year. Uh, and the second quote is a quote from a politician, Representative Bobby Scott, who is a uh, Democratic representative from Virginia, testifying before that hearing I mentioned earlier about uh, the school to prison pipeline. And he actually quotes the Fabello study and he says, research shows that these get tough approaches to discipline not only reinforce bad behavior, but set up uh, progression from disciplinary proceedings to suspension, expulsion, arrest, juvenile or criminal proceedings, jail, and then prison. When we look a little deeper though, uh, we find in fact there's very little evidence to support some of these uh, claims that youth uh, disciplinary practices have a large impact on youth incarceration. So you'll note that the Fabello study talks about contact, contact between youth and school that sort of have been disciplined and the juvenile justice system. Contact is a pretty wide ranging term and it can mean anything from a simple write up and a paper referral to uh, more serious uh, incidents like actually being detained in jail. Uh, when we looked at the data, we find that very few people that have contact with the juvenile justice system through school discipline ever end up being incarcerated. In fact, less than 3% from Fabello's own study even end up being incarcerated. So this number that he said it's three times more likely that you'll be incarcerated comes from, when we dug a little deeper, it didn't make a, a tremendous amount of sense the way he was framing it. He was comparing two groups of students. One, a student that had never had any contact with sort of school disciplinary policies, and the other group that he looked at was those that had 11 plus contacts with uh, uh, disciplinary policies. And what he found was that only uh, sort of looking, comparing those two extremes did you find this sort of uh, distinction emerge. Uh, and even if you had 11 plus disciplinary contacts, only 17% of that whole population ever ended up uh, uh, going to, to jail. So more than 80% of people that have 11 plus disciplinary infractions never end up in jail. Uh, 
And these are important numbers that, in fact, there is this disparity here, but it's hardly an indication that there's a large pipeline that's funneling people from schools uh, into prison via school disciplinary practices. We also looked at the data uh, from California, and we found more limitations uh, in the type of pipeline thinking. Uh, much of the school to prison pipeline literature stresses that increased contact with law enforcement uh, essentially funnels kids into prison. Uh, however, when we looked at what was going on in California, we found that uh, simple contact with law enforcement does not really automatically mean that you're going to be incarcerated. In fact, it's highly dependent on the local uh, criminal justice policies of your specific county. So this table looks at county level variation in arrest rates and confinement rates for juvenile delinquents. And you can see that actually the arrest rate for San Francisco is extremely high, but it has an extremely low rate of confinement. So simply having contact with the juvenile justice system does not necessarily mean that you will lead to incarceration. And contrarily, Kern has a relatively low arrest rate, but a very high, uh, high uh, rate of incarceration. So again, it suggests that uh, the problem of thinking this as a direct pipeline from schools to prison, it's policy choices largely within the criminal justice system rather than schools that determine how many people end up being incarcerated. So when we look at the data that specifically looks at the connection between suspensions and expulsions and ultimately being jailed, we again find limited evidence of a sort of causal connection that's suggested by the school to prison pipeline uh, framework. So this table shows the suspension and the expulsion rate uh, uh, and the confinement rate. And you can see a comparison between Kern County and Glenn County. These are two of uh, uh, the counties in California that have the most similar rates of suspension and expulsion. Uh, and we find that despite both of them having high rates of expansion, er, suspension and expulsion, uh, they have dramatically different confinement rates. So simply having ex uh, extremely harsh disciplinary practices did not necessarily mean that you're going to see increased rates of incarceration. Uh, not much evidence, again, of a clear causal connection between higher rates of school disciplinary uh, practices leading directly to higher rates of incarceration. We also looked at another uh, sort of development suggested by the school to prison pipeline metaphor, uh, which was how often the direct referrals from the schools led to incarceration of youth. Uh, so this is a table that's looking at the years 2002 to 2015. And it shows that uh, schools, parents, and private agencies make up between 1% and 2.4% of referrals to the juvenile justice system. So over 97% of uh, the institutions fun uh, funneling youth into uh, the juvenile justice system are not the school. Schools account for very minimal referrals to juvenile justice system. It's largely come from other places. Now, this is, uh, again, important because hardly any of those people that get referred even ever end up incarcerated. Again, this really calls into question this notion that there's this direct pipeline from schools to prison that is funneling kids uh, into, uh, from one institution into another. And really what we're sort of forced to conclude is schools are not a major means of direct entrance into the prison system. Another claim that sort of I threw out there earlier was that when we contextualize the rise of uh, punitive school disciplinary practices and the rise of use incarceration, we actually find that the account offered by the school to prison pipeline is fairly ahistorical. It really does not make a tremendous amount of sense. California has a long history of having punitive uh, uh, di incarceration practices towards youth. In fact, if you go back to 1941, they were one of the first states to establish uh, youth institutions. And in fact, from 1940 through 2000, California has had the highest uh, youth incarceration rate in the nation. The expansion of facilities, implementation of harsh policies that criminalize youth behavior, and the increased sentencing that were targeted at youth all predate the implementation of harsh school discipline uh, uh, practices. Mass incarceration for youth has not gotten worse uh, 
due to the implementation of school disciplinary practices. In fact, the rise of the punitive uh, school disciplinary practices that we're talking about, expulsion, suspension, uh, in the mid to late 1990s, uh, is associated with a decline in youth incarceration in California. Since 2000, uh, arrest and incarceration rates for youth in California have declined despite more punitive school policies. Between 1989 and 2015, felony arrest rates for youth actually decreased by 80%. And in 1996, there were 10,000 youth incarcerated uh, in state prisons in California. But by 2014, there were fewer than 1,000. So these two developments don't really make a whole lot of sense if school disciplinary practices are supposed to be funneling kids in mass into uh, a sort of juvenile institution. That doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. Why would we see these uh, contrasting developments? So beyond examining the relationship between schools and prison, we were also interested in looking at the role in, uh, that race played in the development of punitive school disciplinary policies. There's a lot of scholarship, particularly that that's associated with the critical race theory, uh, that framed the existence of punitive policies uh, uh, in schools largely as the result of an intentional outcome uh, of schools designed to protect white supremacy. This scholarship doubts the ability of schools to ever represent the interest of non-white students. And it suggests that any strategy aimed at fighting the school to prison pipeline center race first. Uh, and these two quotes that I put up are sort of an indication of this view that we find emerging from the literature. This first quote is uh, from a piece called Schools Suck, But They're Supposed To, which is, gives you sort of a sense of where they're going with this. Uh, and the quote is, schools usually thought to be uh, dysfunctional are actually functioning quite well in a state-sponsored system rooted in white supremacy, settler colonialism, and human subjugation. The second quote comes from uh, the lawsuit that I mentioned at the beginning uh, in Kern County, at, named at the Kern County uh, High School District. And uh, in their lawsuit, the, the plaintiffs state uh, that they believe an empirical research conducted by social scientists from leading universities suggests that such disparities are in part uh, the result of intentional discrimination, implicit bias, implicit associations, stereotype threats, racial anxiety, the effect of in-group preference, and the use of negative stereotypes. This is sort of the framing that comes out of the school to prison pipeline literature when it's discussing the role of race in the development of this supposed pipeline. Once again, when we got on the ground in Kern County, we found a lot of information that did not seem to make sense given the theoretical expectation uh, that were emerging from the literature. And we came to this primarily through one-on-one -on -one interviews with students, many of whom had been the targets of these disciplinary uh, uh, actions in school. Uh, and we found ultimately that uh, an approach centered on race uh, is limited in important ways when it comes to explaining school disciplinary policies. Uh, first, the incidents of school discipline in Kern County itself were substantially mediated by the social, social economic condition of uh, the schools. So this often in times explained more than the racial breakdown uh, of the school. Second, there's not a tremendous amount of evidence that schools are designed and intend to push, punish, and push out students of color, at least in Kern County. Uh, and ultimately, we think that in order to really understand this, you have to have an approach uh, that looks at school discipline that understands the multiple factors that are actually pushing these developments, that many of which do not directly include uh, race. So uh, in examining this, uh, these particular themes, we looked at four schools within Kern County. And these were all schools that were suggested by our uh, interviews with people on the ground. We kept hearing uh, these interviewees talk about the good schools and the bad schools, and largely they were talking about poor schools and rich schools, right? So uh, the four schools that we looked at were Stockdale High, which is uh, one of the wealthiest uh, schools in the district. It's surrounded by a country club, uh, and it's also one of the most racially diverse in the school district as well. The vast majority of its students are not white. Uh, we also looked at uh, Liberty High School, Again, a very rich school surrounded by gated communities. Uh, the majority of its student body was white. 
Uh, and we compared uh, those outcomes to sort of these two bottom schools, North High and South High, which were both poor schools, one having a predominantly uh, white population and another having uh, a much more racially diverse population that was uh, predominantly uh, Latino students. So if we were to follow the expectations emerging from the literature, we should see that regardless of socioeconomic condition, you would expect that the schools with the most racially diverse uh, populations have the highest rates of uh, school discipline. Uh, this is just an indication of what I was just saying. So North High uh, is uh, mostly white, uh, but uh, very poor. Liberty is mostly white, but fairly wealthy. Uh, and Stockdale, uh, racially diverse, fairly wealthy. South High, uh, predominantly Latino and uh, extremely poor as well. When we looked at what was going on in terms of school discipline, we uh, found that harsh disciplinary practices were much more associated with the socioeconomic makeup of the student body rather than the makeup, uh, the racial makeup. And to see this, you can look at the difference between uh, North High and Stockdale High. So Stockdale is one of the most racially diverse student bodies in the entire county, but it also has one of the lowest rates of school discipline, both in terms of suspension and expulsion. We also looked at these defiance and obscenity, suspension and expulsion, because that's uh, typically where teachers and administrators have the most discretion in terms of whether or not they're going to suspend or expel you. So you might expect to see uh, racial bias most prevalent in those ones where there is discretion on whether or not you're going to uh, suspend or expel. Uh, and again, we find that it has relatively or extremely low rates of expulsion and suspension despite the fact that it has a majority non-white student body. Uh, contrarily, North High, which is overwhelmingly white given the, the makeup of the uh, uh, overall county, has one of the highest rates of suspension and expulsion in Kern County. Uh, and what this suggests is that uh, it's not just a function of maintaining white supremacy that explains the uh, sort of the explosion of these punitive uh, practices. There was some concern that maybe, you know, these, these numbers here are only targeted towards the uh, uh, minorities within North High, and so we actually checked for that using federal data, and we found that uh, uh, their suspension rate for youth of color and whites within each school actually looks remarkably similar to the point where it's almost uh, indistinguishable. And again, this provides the narrative, or a challenge to the narrative that disciplinary practices are all about maintaining white supremacy. Rather, the disparities here seem to be a result of the fact that there are uh, a lot more poor students of color in Kern County rather than poor white students. So overall, if you looked at the district as a whole, you would see these racial disparities. But when you look at the schools, you see a lot of this is the result of the uh, sort of monetary and class differences. So. The fact that the school to prison pipeline literature points to race as the reason for punitive disciplinary practices falls uh, into some of the same ahistoricism that I was talking about earlier in regards to the relationship between schools and prison. In fact, there are multiple factors that drove the rise in the use of suspension and expulsion. And rather than address this, a lot of the literature tends to take the existence of racial disparities as the cause of school disciplinary practices. So uh, one example here is the uh, high stake testing environment. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that suggests part of the reason that teachers turn to expulsion and suspension is due to a high stakes testing environment where their pay and retention is often tied to student performance. So there's been a lot of literature that focuses on push out as a means of sort of making sure that uh, teachers can boost their performance scores and actually won't be punished monetarily or uh, with their job. Uh, and ironically, some of the strongest supporters for these high stake testing, uh, the continuation of high stake testing come from the civil rights community. In fact, in the latest rewrite of the federal education law, the uh, uh, educational uh, success for all uh, passed in 2015, or Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, it was a coalition of civil rights groups which included the NAACP and the Mexican American Legal Defense Education Fund that threatened to withhold support for passage of the bill unless 
these types of high state testings were included uh, in the, uh, the final passage of the bill. There's also a lot of other reasons uh, that sort of lead to the uh, use of suspension and expulsion uh, that we won't have time to get into today, but things like privatization, charterization, and uh, the funding crisis within public schools. In fact, Kern County has still yet to recover uh, its pre-2008 funding levels uh, for schools. And really this has created a situation where you have teachers that are teaching the classes of uh, excess of 50 students, and many of them turn to uh, expulsion and suspension as a classroom management tool uh, more than anything else. So the point is that the alternatives are driven by uh, political, uh, economic, structural uh, factors that are not on their face uh, directly tied to decisions uh, of schools and the organization of schools with the intent of pushing out and punishing uh, students as a means of maintaining white supremacy, which is some of the suggestion that we see emerging from the school to prison pipeline literature. In fact, Kern County also provides a vivid illustration of the limitations of centering racial disparities in the fight against school disciplinary practices. Uh, when you reduce the issue of, racial, uh, of school discipline to the racial disparities alone, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to solve school discipline uh, practices. And we can actually see this if we look at the numbers for uh, Kern County in 2009, 2010. So that year, uh, Latino students were expelled at a rate that was 3.5 times that of white students. Black students were expelled at a rate that was six times the rate of white students. But if you focus only on reducing those numbers to equaling the rate of whites, you would still be left with an extremely punitive environment in Kern County. And we, can, we know this because white students in Kern County were expelled at a rate that was over five times the rate of California and almost 13 times the rate of the nation as a whole. So if you reduce the disparities alone, you would still have a very punitive uh, school environment. So ultimately, beyond uh, these mischaracterizations uh, of the connection between schools uh, and prisons and how we get punitive disciplinary practices, I think that the school to prison pipeline framework is problematic because it points us in the wrong direction in terms of solution. It tends to reinforce this notion that we can solve problems like mass incarceration by focusing on schools and adjusting school policies. This really has tended to place a lot of the blame on schools as key contributors to the rise of mass incarceration and really undermine public support for public education. Uh, as Lester Spence has pointed out, placing blame uh, or placing more responsibility on schools as opposed to dealing with the structural conditions they face tends to increase rather than decrease poor educational outcomes. And the literature's tendency to narrow the focus of injustice onto questions about how it is distributed racially uh, rather than uh, the immensity of the scope of the problem has led to an instance of what uh, uh, sort of what Ray Adolf Reed is talking about in this quote here, where he says, a focus on the racial disparity accepts the premise that the problem of inequality is not its magnitude or intensity in general, but whether or not it is distributed in racially uh, equitable ways. So to reiterate some of the key points from this talk, uh, school discipline is neither the cause of nor the solution to uh, youth incarceration or mass incarceration more broadly. Race really cannot offer a full account for the patterns of school discipline that we see in Kern County in California or even nationally. We need to situate these problems in broader economic context. None of the preceding, what I said before this, is meant to suggest that punitive school disciplinary practices are not extremely troubling or that racial disparities that do exist are not horrendous. They are. They are troubling and they are horrendous. The problem, though, is that pipeline thinking leads us away from considering the types of solution that would actually lead towards policies that would begin to scale back and reverse some of these troubling t trends. Uh, thanks for your time. Well, I'm curious to know your reasons for pursuing this particular study in your life and what maybe was in your background that led you to this pursuit. Well, 
Uh, this is a good question. Uh, as I was working in, uh, towards completion of my dissertation, uh, I was always thinking of, oh, I'd much rather be doing something else, uh, which is a tendency when you focus on one project for seven years. Uh, but it was really in conversation with my co-author, who was working on a very similar uh, project in juvenile justice, and our frustration with some of the limitations of uh, the literature that we were seeing. And I guess the reason why I think this is important is because I actually am concerned about the issues of punitive school disciplinary practices and of the racial disparities that emerge, and was frustrated with the fact that the literature was repeatedly pointing us towards solutions that were not going to deal with the problem. Uh, and I think this tendency to associate schools as an important source of fighting uh, incarceration eventually uh, and fighting uh, sort of bad behavior of youth that will prevent uh, sort of future imprisonment is really problematic because a lot of the literature on mass incarceration suggests that in fact it has nothing to do with individual behavior or individual preparedness. It's really about these broader uh, policy decisions in regards to criminal justice. A consistent finding is that crime rates have nothing to do with how many people are actually incarcerated. And some of our biggest crime booms have come when we've actually seen declining rates of crime. So trying to solve these problems like this through behavioral adjustments or policy, tiny policy adjustments within the schools is not gonna get us to where we wanna go. So why this project in particular, I think it was the realization that you had to push back against some of the conventional or the accepted wisdom that's leading us down these problematic paths in order to get us to where we ultimately wanna go. Yeah, um, so you talk a lot about what's not the cause and correlations and all that to see um, not fit with the literature. So based on what you've done so far, mm -hmm. where are you going next? What's your hypothesis about what is the problem to solve some of the things that you said? Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, so we have now turned more to the uh, broader historical shift to explain first why we tend to associate uh, schools and prisons. And what we found, sort of briefly offer an argument, is that uh, the development of federal education policy and federal juvenile justice uh, policy occurred back in the 1960s and really developed in tandem. And it occurred, uh, occurred at a particular moment where the Democratic Party was shifting away from uh, aggressively redistributionist policies and thinking about crime in ways that were connected directly to political economy. And they began to frame it as responsible uh, as primarily the result of either uh, individual behavior or the human capital that a particular person brought to the table and they explained crime that way. That led to the focus on if we can just sort of change their behavior in schools or provide them a bit more uh, skills in schools then that will sort of solve the crime problem. Uh, but I think when we looked at Kern County, we saw that repeatedly the biggest issues that were driving some of the trends and the uses in uh, school disciplinary practices had a lot to do with the political economic environment of Kern County. It was a district that has 70% uh, 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 participation in free and reduced uh, lunch. Uh, and uh, the overall uh, unemployment is 30% higher than the state as a whole. The average income is about half of the state as a whole. And uh, this shows up in things like when we were talking to administrators and teachers saying, well, how would you actually go about reducing the number of punitive policies that are used in these situations? They repeatedly would stress parental involvement. Uh, when we talked to parents, they said, well, I'm leaving, getting up at 3 a.m. and going out to work in a field for 12 days. I can't skip that in order to go attend a parent-teacher uh, conference that is scheduled right in the middle of the day because I have to focus on putting food on my table first. Uh, and uh, the other thing is uh, so associated directly to uh, the political economy is the fact that the funding has been repeatedly reduced and not kept up with inflation. So you see these situations where teachers are put in uh, uh, teaching situations where they have to deal with 40 or 50 students in one classroom. And because there aren't, there's not the capacity to sort of break that up, it leads to uh, unsurprisingly disciplinary practice, er, problems within the uh, classroom that they choose to solve through one of the only means that are available, which is through suspension or exp uh, expulsion. So, that's why largely we think you have to focus outside of the specific school policies to focus on what's going on in the broader political economic environment. And in this uh, sort of era of retrenchment and 
refusal to sort of provide generous funding for, the, for schools in particular, uh, there's really no way that you can solve, uh, solve this problem. In fact, Dr. Houston. Appreciate your presentation. <coughs> I have a question about the literature. If you came across uh, some of the critical race scholars like Bell or Crenshaw, the kind of privilege and interdisciplinary approach that means. Sorry, Dr. Houston, I can't hear you. I was going to ask if you encountered uh, interdisciplinary approach in your literature review. Some of the critical race scholars like Crenshaw or Bell who privileged looking at class as well as race, and if they had any different conclusions than what some of the other scholars like Sloan have to say. Yeah, I mean, there definitely uh, were degrees within critical race theory in terms of their willingness to say the intent of these disciplines is to discriminate and to push out students of color and to maintain a system of uh, 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 racial supremacy, or uh, white supremacy in, in particular. Uh, I guess when it uh, came to sort of the scholars of color that I, whose approach I tended to gravitate towards were those like Lester Spence and Adolf Reed that really centered political economic approaches. Uh, and again, the point is, in some sense, they all agree that the racial disparities are problematic, but there's a fundamental disagreement about how you go about reducing and addressing those. And I guess I do see a troubling tendency within the critical race theory scholarship to focus on disparities as sort of the be all and end all. And if we can just eliminate that, then eventually we will uh, uh, sort of get to where we need to go. There are some important exceptions, but uh, I guess that was sort of my frustration with that particular literature. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Could you pop back to the first screen where you had the, the model up there? Not to maybe the STPP, the oh. very first one. Yep. Because I'm wondering if um, that model, given what you've laid before, is is there room for tweaking it? But it's you know at some point if you tweak a model so much then it's no longer the original model. STP, yeah. Wait, was that it? That yeah. Okay. This reminds me of the motor oil. Um, okay. So one of the things that you said was that there was this direct relationship. Mm -hmm. If what you've laid out, and you, we now sort of adjust it so that we're really talking about an indirect relationship, mm -hmm. and we're looking at K through 12 as a kind of incubator for, for the community in terms of economic stability right. or economic advancement, mm -hmm. can you still hold on to the pipeline model? Uh, this is a really good question. I think one of the most difficult things to think through in this is that there are some that sort of adopt the school to prison pipeline literature and suggest sort of a downstream effect, right? It's not necessarily about this direct connection, but it's about uh, what education provides for the individual and for the community as a whole. And I guess I'm resistant to that because it is still relying on sort of what I would consider to be a supply side understanding, which is that the problem that why people go to prison and why people aren't economically successful has to do with the skills that they bring to the marketplace or what they do or don't learn in education. And that is an approach that does not appeal to me or to me make a, a tremendous amount of sense. I think it's much more about a uh, economic environment that does not provide enough well-paying jobs, an economic environment that has the last estimate about a $25 million uh, living wage job uh, environment. So focusing on schools, I think, tends to reinforce this idea that we can solve the problem through school. I guess where it gets a little hairy is the suggestion is not that schools don't matter at all or what you do in schools don't matter at all. but uh, uh, I don't think it's going to, I, I really see no reason to suspect why it could really deal with this problem of mass incarceration or youth incarceration because I don't think there's a tremendous amount of evidence that this connection really exists. It's more of a common sense understanding that sort of makes sense to us on an intuitive level, but when you dig uh, beneath it a little bit, there's some uh, really contrary facts to uh, what the, that theory would suggest, even if you take the more sort of limited downstream effect uh, understanding. Time for one more question, comment? Yes. So who's referring all of these people to jail? Anna, you, just like in class, you're going to have to speak up a little bit more. Right. Sorry. So who's referring all the people to jail all the schools? That's a good question. It traditionally tends to be uh, uh, direct contact through law enforcement is often the most uh, uh, 
uh, immediate route to incarceration rather than referrals from uh, schools or from, from parents. Uh, and that was, I think, one of the most surprising findings to us was that you know, that's only one to three percent of all people that get referred to the juvenile justice system come from schools because if you were to believe the school to prison pipeline, you would suggest that number to be like 90 percent, right? Uh, so really it's more this direct contact with law enforcement, uh, which I think ties back to you know, a broader point that is really decisions about criminal justice policy that explain youth incarceration rates, not really a tremendous amount to do with school disciplinary practices or a pipeline that funnels schools or children directly from schools into prison. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.